Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Filip Ivanov, and I'm the CEO of Asia Society Australia. Uh, welcome back to virtual Asia Society and to our Looking Ahead live event on international education, featuring panel of uh, incredible education experts. Um, before we begin, Asia Society acknowledges that many participants in today's event are dialing in from locations that have traditional owners and custodians. Today, I'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge their traditional owners of this land and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to welcome and acknowledge any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander or First Nations people joining our webcast today. It's wonderful to have you all here online and in such a number. Uh, our panel discussion today, actually the first one that we're doing on international education formally in many years, uh, will shed light on uh, Australian new international education reality uh, during and after the pandemic. Uh, the event essentially will bring to life uh, our Looking Ahead publication, uh, which was uh, just written by Phil Honeywood, who is the CEO of International Education Association of Australia. Uh, Looking Ahead project is essentially a series of analytical articles that look at the interface between Australia and Asia and how the pandemic is going to change that or keep it the same. Now, the essay, which I would all encourage you to read, and it's on our website, uh, looks at the impact of the COVID-19 on Australia's international education sector and what can be done now and in the immediate future to get it back on track, but also to revitalize and perhaps reset some of the foundations of this incredible uh, industry, but also an incredible interface that allows us to work uh, and educate uh, students from all across the world, but predominantly from our own region here in Australia. Um, before I hand over to my co-host and our board member, Jenny Lang, who will formally start off today's event, let me quickly go through some housekeeping. Um, the hope that today's session can be as interactive as possible uh, on an online platform. So the panel discussion will run for approximately 25 minutes and we'll then move to Q&A from the audience. So please get your questions ready. Uh, as we go along, please feel free to submit those questions and comments through the live chat box uh, at any time, which is located at the right uh, corner of your YouTube live video. Um, now, it's my pleasure to introduce Jenny Lang AM, uh, a true pioneer of the sector and our, our board member. Jenny Lang AM is a board director of Asia Society Australia. She's an honorary fellow and former vice president for advancement at the University of New South Wales. Jenny's career in higher education spanned 35 years in four institutions, including Newcastle College of Advanced Education, Brisbane College of Advanced Education, Queensland University of Technology, and UNSW. She has been recognized for her leadership in this sector and in this space by winning many awards and she was awarded AM for her services to higher education uh, in 2018. We're delighted Jenny could join us and start this conversation as well as uh, lead the discussion. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you so much, Philip. And may I congratulate you and your team on the extraordinary program of events that we've been enjoying online um, over the past few months. Um, it's been outstanding and the member only events and also the public forums such as one we're about to embark on today have just been wonderful for those of us in remote locations. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to welcome you all to this special event today on behalf of the Asia Society Board. This is um, a new series of ours called Looking Ahead and the topic international education has become incredibly um, topical over the past few months as we have seen the unfolding of the COVID crisis in our country and as it has impacted various sectors. 
International education in Australia has been a great success story. We now host over 600,000 international students. As a sector, we have done a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to our multilateral and bilateral agreements, and also through enormous research effort and collaboration with partners around the world and increasingly with the Asia Pacific region. The economic benefits as well are enormous. Um, as Philip mentioned, the sector touches many other industries in a positive way. And through our universities and education providers, um, many of those institutions are now major employers and industries such as aviation, tourism, real estate, hospitality have benefited enormously off the side of our international education program. But who could foresee the disruption that was about to occur when we entered 2020? Um, we've endured crises before, but never on a magnitude or scale of what we have seen in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. And I think what has been so interesting for all of us is to see the rapid response of the broader education sector um, as courses were very quickly placed online and as the needs of students um, were looked after um, in a wonderful way. And I think the resilience of the sector has come to the fore again, um, and we can all be grateful for that. But as I've spoken to colleagues in international education over the past week, um, I'm hearing words now that it's an opportunity to rethink, reset, and reimagine what the future of international education might be post COVID and given the fact that we have increasingly put our programs online. Today, we have an extraordinary lineup of very experienced and passionate international educators, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce them. Anchoring this session today will be Phil Honeywood, who is the CEO of the International Education Association of Australia. Phil has been in the role since 2011 and has been a wonderful advocate for the sector at large and also for international students. And we're grateful for the work he does. He has held senior positions in the Victorian government, has been a minister for tertiary education and also um, was member for Warren Bart for many years. Um, but we're just grateful for the advocacy that he has been providing. Also joining Phil today is Nicole um, Brigg, who is Pro Vice-Chancellor International at Macquarie University. Nicole has served in leadership positions across all sectors of international education for more than 20 years. And Nicole currently chairs the New South Wales Vice-Chancellor's International Committee. And also joining the panel is Wong Yu Lee, who is Deputy Vice-Chancellor External Engagement from the University of Queensland. Rong Yu is responsible for all of UQ's external engagement and has served in leadership positions at Canberra University, RMIT University and Deakin University and is currently the Chair of the Universities Australia Deputy Vice-Chancellors, Pro-Vice-Chancellors International Group. It's a pleasure to have you join us today and now I'd like to pass to Phil. Thank you, Jenny. And first and foremost, thank you to the Asia Society for this wonderful uh, innovation. And I'm sure that many uh, who are listening today would appreciate both people who work in the industry, but importantly, people who may have not had much exposure to international education will appreciate how important these initiatives are. Great to be introduced by one of our sector's leading icons, uh, who's you know, was at the forefront of the foundation of International Education Australia in Jenny. And also wonderful to be joined by uh, both Rong Yu Lee and uh, Nicole Brigg, who are both good friends, but also very senior leaders in international education, not just in Australia, but globally as well. Ladies and gentlemen, international education, I'm sure for many of you who read the paper, international education is a quiet achiever for Australia. And it's only in recent times really that many people have been willing in the sector to refer to it as an industry. We came out of a pretty an Australian aid program, for want of a better description, uh, and also concerns about what future Asian-based leaders would do uh, in a uh, communist um, 
situation uh, with the Vietnam War um, and on the back of World War II. So what transpired with a wonderful scholarship program called the Colombo Plan, which provided tuition uh, free uh, fee um, places to future young leaders identified across the Indo-Pacific region. And from that, we discovered in Australia that we were very good at teaching uh, international young people and that we, there was an appetite in the developing countries across our region for their young people to be able to access world-class uh, university education. So in the 1980s, thanks to the Hawke government initiative with uh, John Dawkins as Minister of the Time federally, we are able to really uh, start to charge tuition fees for those young people who, uh, whose families could afford uh, full fees. But it's important to also acknowledge that most of our universities also had wonderful scholarship programs throughout that period of development of our industry. So according to ABS, it's now a $40 billion a year industry, but those of us who work in the sector would argue very strongly that it's, not, it's more than just the money. <laughs> and of course, the money has been crucial in funding research endeavor, uh, in funding new buildings on campus, in doing a lot of student service cross subsidization for our domestic students. But it's really been a wonderful soft power, soft diplomacy initiative uh, that has really meant that Australia has taught young leaders in science, in politics, uh, across a range of fields in ac academe, who've gone back to their home countries and in many cases are now leading those countries in those er fields and areas. I should add, of course, that 84% of the young people we teach from around the world do go back home. And there's a misconception in the wider Australian community that they all get a migration outcome or they come here to have a migration outcome. Our own Treasury Department in Canberra has indicated in a report 18 months ago, 84% of these students go home. And in recent times, we've been delighted to see new key student source countries such as Colombia, Brazil, now in our top five and top 10 uh, student source countries. The other point I will just make in introduction is really to say that Australia has a pedagogical advantage, which we often overlook. And having been taught in Japan, Myself, uh, as a senior high school student, I can tell you that uh, in many countries, of course, there's a rote learning system of teaching. In Australia, because we have for many years taught via critical thinking, creative learning, it's given us a pedagogical advantage which global corporations now look to. Global corporations want young people who've been taught in a team project-based uh, pedagogy, who are critical thinkers, who've got intercultural competencies, as you would get in a multicultural country like Australia. And so it's really, if you like, a coming together of global trends that's matched the pedagogical advantage Australia has um, in that, for our international education industry. And of course, the industry itself is more than some of its parts. So it does include English language colleges. It includes uh, 39 wonderful public universities. It includes private vocational education providers, TAFE, offshore delivery through transnational education, online delivery. Uh, so these are all the elements that hopefully we can uh, address today for you. And I'll now uh, hand over to my good friend, Nicole Brick, and ask her, how does she think the sector is responding to the current climate, which changes every 24 hours in the last few weeks, um, as we know from China? And uh, what are universities in particular and peak bodies take, uh, doing to serve current and future international students needs. Hey, thanks, Phil. Well, it's actually been a very creative couple of months, I think, for, uh, for the international education sector and universities in particular. And I, I think the, the, the first and most obvious innovation was our rapid pivot to online learning at scale. Uh, many of us have been involved in online uh, teaching over the years. Uh, but we achieved in one month uh, a, a level of scale that we really probably didn't anticipate being able to do in the next decade. Um, and, uh, and in the process, uh, we rapidly upskilled uh, in the technology uh, options that are available with online learning and, and we reset our expectations and our understanding of what good, line, uh, what good online learning is. Um, and we're really going to lift the quality 
um, of the education experience uh, when we resume face-to-face -face teaching because we have new tools, new understandings, and blended learning is going to be a, a, a much richer, much more dynamic experience uh, for all students um, going, going forward. So that was one big innovation, I think. Uh, a second is this, we did the same thing with, uh, with marketing. Uh, and uh, for those of us who work in the, the, the global engagement for our universities, uh, we've, we've all sort of learned how to do webinars at scale, uh, to do uh, research symposia, to do uh, the interactions that we have with university partners around the world uh, using Zoom and Skype. And we're all getting better at better and, at doing that in a more interesting, more dynamic and, and ultimately richer and more meaningful manner. So I think another uh, big step forward, another great innovation there. Uh, thinking about the, the, the peak bodies, um, what strikes me as I, I reflect on, on this question is the way that the international education sector have come together uh, to share information, uh, to reach agreement on the things that really matter to us at this, this challenging time, uh, and then how we've all worked together to take that information forward to government um, across peak bodies such as IEAA, led by yourself, Phil, um, Universities of Australia, the group of eight, uh, and all the committees uh, in the different states and territories. Uh, we, we may not be getting where we want to at the pace that we want to, uh, but I, I, I can't remember a coming together of the international education sector uh, and the level of sharing of information that I'm seeing at the moment, I think is, is heartening. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that we, we could do more than we are at the moment. We just have to keep trying and hoping that government hears our voice. Thank you, Nicole. And Rong Yu Lee, Obviously, uh, University of Queensland, and with your wider role in the sector, you're very much aware of uh, the unfortunate situation we had when our Prime Minister, of course, indicated, I think it was in Q&A rather than an address necessarily, that those international students who could not afford to stay in Australia should think about going home. And that unfortunately created a number of perception issues. Would you be able to sort of, I guess, highlight some of the issues that our international students who perhaps haven't been able to get home or um, chose not to go home to COVID-19 affected home countries, how they're dealing with uh, life here at the moment and what universities are doing to support them in particular. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I think it was unfortunate that our Prime Minister delivered that message. Uh, in fact, you know, the, uh, the providers uh, have been very supportive and, uh, and are showing a lot of care, uh, duty of care. And in fact, you know, they put you know, many practical measures to support international students. I think, you know, when the, uh, the, the COVID-19 hit us, uh, and especially the international students who managed to get to Australia before the uh, travel ban and the restrictions, uh, they are faced with, you know, many, many challenges, you know, financial, uh, because most of them work part-time in the service sector, and th those jobs just, you know, gone instantly. And emotional, mental health challenges, we all know uh, mental health has been a very common uh, issue associated with international students. Uh, I think that, that, that is getting worse and they don't have you know family support uh, you know they don't have that network uh, away from home i think covid 19 just adds to the anxiety and especially when everybody's worried about you know how the country was going to beat the curve they also actually faced with policy uncertainties in terms of visa status uh, i think whether you know, study online is going to make them eligible for post-study work visa entitlement. You know, those things, you know, have been actually on people's mind a lot. Uh, and to be honest, uh, as much as, you know, as Nicole said, we did really well to move teaching learning online and at scale, I think it took a lot of adjustment, uh, both actually from students' point of view and also from our, you know, lecturer and, and academic community point of view. You know, how do you actually do it when, you know, the teachers are not necessarily trained, you know, with that skill and the students, the reason that they come to us and pay quite expensive fees and a higher cost of living is that they want that face to face interaction, you know, that learning process, rather than actually studying online and fully online uh, for semester one uh, in locked rooms. I think, you know, there are serious issues, uh, but the sector 
and also state governments have come to the rescue. Uh, I think uh, I give, you know, the state and territory governments a lot of credit, you know, for uh, exercising, you know, care uh, as we do as providers. Thank you. And of course, at the moment, many of us are focused on how to get returning students back here who've already got a student visa and have interrupted their studies through no fault of their own, but also to get new students back. And uh, would you like to just reflect perhaps um, both of you on how you're aware that state governments are putting forward their secure corridor proposals to National Cabinet, um, where those proposals in Nicole's case in New South Wales, uh, in Ron Lee's case in Queensland, uh, are taking us uh, in terms of being a federation and the joys of the federal system of government, um, the challenges of the federal system, how the federal government is saying, well, the health commissioners in each state and territory, uh, they're relying on them to get the state governments to come to national cabinet with meaningful proposals about how to get international students back to Australia or new students into Australia. Would you like to reflect on those uh, innovations? Um, if I may, uh, I think uh, the sector has come together and uh, trying to figure out, you know, ways to uh, bring students back to Australian university campuses and, and to other providers. Uh, but given high education uh, has the lion's share of international students and many people who didn't get to come in, uh, they still have valid visas to travel. I think that particular cohort of students uh, are being looked at. Uh, in, in the security corridor uh, proposal. Uh, Nicole can speak uh, about New South Wales. Certainly in Queensland, we worked very hard with the uh, study Queensland, uh, Queensland uh, Trade and Investment, and the ministers, the chief health officer, trying to actually, uh, you know, uh, come up with the uh, Queensland specific secure corridor proposal. And I believe the uh, draft proposal is with the chief uh, health officer uh, for her to, to look at, and she may come back to us, you know, very quickly. Uh, it is unfortunate that, you know, it's a state, it's a federal system that we all have to work individually, even though they, they, uh, we have shared objective. Uh, but I think uh, from a, uh, a political point of view, uh, it, it is a plus if all territory and, and uh, state government, you know, using their um, membership uh, in the national cabinet with the lobby on the university behalf. And Nicole, New South Wales, how would you reflect on how that's going um, to Yes, no, well, look, the, uh, I mean, the New South Wales, you know, bringing students uh, uh, back plan is in an advanced state of preparedness. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think we're, we're actually, you know, ready to proceed. Uh, we're just waiting, um, is my understanding, on uh, uh, final approvals from the Commonwealth Government. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, universities are, are, are ready to, uh, to, to work with police and health authorities um, and uh, border security uh, to implement practical plans, uh, which are effectively utilising the same uh, mechanism uh, that's being used to repatriate Australians. Uh, so most days of the week, there are up to 5,000 Australians in quarantine in uh, CBD hotels in Sydney. So the, the methodology is well set up, um, and I think we're, we're definitely ready to begin. Uh, and uh, universities, of course, one of the things the Commonwealth wants us to do is to, is to reopen for face-to-face -face teaching in session two. Um, I think all universities are working on plans to do so. Uh, but we also, again, as, as long you mentioned, this question of... Um, of, uh, of um, you know, federal decision making, we're all waiting uh, for governments to resume uh, public transport uh, in, a, you know, in a way that will facilitate the movement of staff and students across our cities uh, in order to be able to get to campus for face-to-face -face teaching. Uh, but I think we're all hopeful that uh, that, that will, uh, will move quickly in the weeks ahead. And of course, some of us um, and some commentators have pointed to the fact that because Australia has uh, contained the virus, relatively well compared to a major competitor study destination countries, be it uh, USA, be it uh, UK, that again, I guess New Zealand, Australia, uh, we compete against New Zealand, of course, um, are in a very good position uh, as we come out of COVID-19 pandemic to be seen by overseas families as a safe uh, destination. And of course, in all of that, our academic year 
might also help us because our academic year, the, the main uh, starts the year is of course in February, March. And of course, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's actually in August. So uh, if you're sitting in a European university hoping to get international students from Asia at the moment, you'd be very worried about the prospect of that happening in August, whereas hopefully come February, March, if we don't have a second wave, we'll be in a very good position, subject of course to our federal government's visa flexibilities and support. So if we look therefore, Nicole and Rongyu Lee, coming out of this uh, pandemic, what do you think some of the lessons that we've learned in terms of what we might need to do, for example, transnational education is something that the UK has been very good at, but Australia has been really quite slow to invest in, you know, offshore delivery. Um, and we've talked about online delivery and also, of course, pathway feeder high schools where international high schools are becoming very popular in Indonesia, in China. Would you like to reflect on some of those, I guess, changes that Australia might need to embrace in order to take advantage of the fact that we're seen to have contained the virus fairly well? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the high school, uh, you know, certificate situation is, is one that Ron, you and I both, uh, both worked in, in that part of the sector. Uh, and, uh, and it is certainly the case that competitors, uh, the UK in particular with the ONA levels and, and Canada, uh, with the Canadian senior certificate, they have been very successful uh, in building um, a recognition of their education systems uh, through, uh, you know, making available uh, that single um, syllabus uh, and curriculum and qualification for their high school systems. And we certainly have been hampered uh, by our federal approach to, um, to certificates. And in a, in a market such as China, uh, it, it's quite evident to see that there's actually um, a degree of competition between the Queensland, New South Wales, Victorian, South Australian certificates rather than a, a, a coming together, a collaboration uh, and an ability to build a brand Australia in that way. Um, I think we all had hoped that the, the national curriculum would move the conversation forward um, and uh, take us to where we, we need to be. Um, and uh, I, I hope that that journey is, is, is still continuing. Um, for, you know, in terms of, of uh, transnational education, uh, I think that there are institutions in Australia for whom that has been a, a, key, um, a key element of their, their global strategy. Uh, and there are other institutions that have always felt that it was, it was the on-campus experience and the interaction with, with, uh, with other students and, and with that university that, that was the, 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 key, um, the key experience. But um, I often reflect on the value of international education to Australia from a, a, a diplomacy perspective. Uh, I think we now have something like two and a half million alumni of Australian universities around the world. The majority are, are in Asia. Uh, and a, a quick glance uh, at the Australian economy shows you uh, that we are very reliant on our trading relationships in Asia. Uh, and I, I think it, it continues to be very important for this country uh, for our, our a sustainable and prosperous future uh, that we continue to play a key part in the education um, of, um, of students in Asia uh, and that our own students have the opportunity to spend time in Asia in particular. Uh, the, the benefits of that in the long term for the Australian economy are you know, too many to enumerate uh, in the short time that we have here. Rongye, over to you. Uh, uh, thanks, Nicole, and uh, it's a good question, Phil. I think COVID-19 has certainly prompted you know, every Australian university to look at you know, what you know, each and every university is going to look like you know, in five years' time or even before that. Uh, I think certainly it has changed the way we think about uh, international education. Uh, I do think uh, there's a lot uh, a lot of positives coming out of COVID-19, certainly the uh, newly acquired capability to deliver uh, courses and programs online uh, to a wide, you know, wide range of uh, students you know, across the globe. That's something I don't think anybody is going to be easily letting go. I think we have to actually capitalize on that newly acquired capability. Uh, in terms of transnational education, 
uh, certainly, you know, there are very good examples, you know, you have RMIT, Curtin, and uh, James Cook, and, you know, a few, uh, Swim and a few others, they always have, you know, had offshore campuses. Uh, I think going forward, it's going to be a hybrid model. Uh, it's not going to be either or, uh, it's, but I do think the face-to-face -face, uh, teaching and learning uh, the bread and butter model for Australian universities will actually continue for some time to come. But along the way, I think we need to think about how you actually redistribute the risks. How do you manage, you know, the different delivery arms of the university and making sure that, you know, we don't have all the eggs in one basket. But because we've had it so easy and where we are located in the Asia Pacific, which is you know, very fitting that Asia Society is organizing this webcast. Uh, and we are all part of Asia. And I think it's important for us to, to be seen uh, continuously as a valuable uh, contributor, you know, to the education of knowledge workers in the 21st century. Thank you, Rodri. I think now uh, the CEO of Asia Society, uh, Philip, can perhaps lead a Q&A discussion from some of our participants who've uh, been listening to us preach the gospel um, uh, of international education, but it's probably time that we heard from people who have been uh, kindly registering for this event. Uh, thank you, Phil, and thank you, Nicole and Drew Nui. Uh, I really liked your comment, Drew Nui, that many positives came out of COVID-19. It's the first time I hear something like this. I'm going to use it for all our events. <laughs> Um, I guess uh, my first question is just more generally to you about the, the future of universities. Uh, obviously, international education uh, part of our universities is a, is a big part, but there's bigger questions that people are asking about the future of education industry post COVID-19. Um, and one view that is uh, uh, fairly a common is that our university perhaps have grown too big in terms of the number of students, the number of staff and the programs they offer, their physical footprint in our cities and the buildings. What's, um, what's your view, Nicole and Drew and you, on this, on this opinion? Well, uh, speaking for Macquarie University, we've, um, you know, we see ourselves very much as a university of, of, of service and engagement for the community around us. Um, and our growth uh, over the last five years has been modest and steady um, and, uh, and uh, you know, very connected to the community. And the, the same, in truth, uh, is the case for our international approach. Um, our, our executive group decided, I think, five years ago uh, that a, a very balanced cohort was the priority. Uh, so we've worked very hard to sort of have about, you know, a, a, a third, a third, a third from different parts of the world. Um, and, uh, and also to uh, maintain a relatively modest footprint and not to go over about 30% uh, of the total student cohort in our, our international footprint. So, um, you know, even though, you know, this, this situation with COVID-19 is very difficult um, for, for all universities. Uh, I think that, um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, our university strategies have put us in a, a, you know, a, a good position uh, to, uh, to, to come through this. Notwithstanding, as Ron, you said, there are, there are many lessons for us all to learn uh, through this exercise. And, uh, and, and we will find, you know, those silver linings and those learnings uh, and, and take them forward. I cannot believe that universities don't have a, a great future, an important future uh, in our societies uh, going forward. Uh, it, it's a very good question, Philip. Uh, I, I think it's a question uh, for Australian universities to think about. It's also a question for the Australian general public to think about. And it's a question for the Australian government to think about. You know, what is the role of universities in, the, in, in this 21st century global you know, economic society. I think, you know, uh, over the years, uh, because of our success in international education, as a small country, small population, we've managed to get seven universities in the top 100. You know, that's a massive achievement. That actually puts Australia on the map. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't actually say that we've outgrown or too big and, and, and meeting with some challenges. 
the COVID-19 is something that nobody, you know, could actually predict. Uh, but I think, you know, will we'll come out. And if you look at the uh, Thomas Barlow's report about the size of universities and the scale of operations, you know, he's drawn the conclusion that, you know, when you get into some economy of scale, that's when you actually have, you know, secured the sustainability and viability issue. And I think we also need to look, um, you know, globally, because education, internet education, you know, is local, but it's also national and global, you know, knowledge creation, knowledge transfer, research collaboration, transcend the national boundaries. So if we actually take that global perspective to what we do as a sector, I think, you know, that, that way, as general public, as univer uh, universities, as our student government, then we can decide what do we want our universities to do? You know, what sort of a role we want them to play as a public instrument, you know, helping enhancing Australia's national competitiveness in, in, in a global, you know, contested context. Thank you, Ross. Very, very good answers. Um, I'm going to turn to the audience uh, for questions, and we have quite a few coming up. Um, the first one is really about the Chinese government's warning uh, this week to their students uh, to be cautious about traveling and studying in Australia. Uh, and uh, the question from our listener, is Beijing going to take real steps to limit the number of students who come to Australia in 2020, 2021, or is it just a political maneuver that won't have an impact? I might start with you, Phil, and then pass on to Nicole and Joe New. Look, uh, it's a really crystal ball question, I'm afraid. Um, clearly, Australia was taken aback when we had the 80% tariff uh, placed on our barley. Um, we we're also uh, very concerned when four of the main uh, meat processing abattoirs in Australia uh, had their exports banned. But in each of those cases, there was a, if you like, a, uh, a quasi-justification to do with um, labelling, uh, to do with arguments around cross subsidization etc. In the case of international education, it's much more difficult for a country such as China to argue that we're a racist country, that we're uh, a country that's uh, not safe because of COVID-19. And it's been very interesting today to see quite a number of Chinese students actually pushing back and saying, well, on Weibo and so on, saying uh, platforms that uh, Australia is actually very safe. So uh, unfortunately, this issue, which we would regard normally, Philip, as a people-to-people -people issue, uh, as an issue where Chinese families know of somebody in their friendship group or in their wider family network who has been to a country like Australia and know how uh, wonderful the experience has been. Um, it's really, unfortunately, a geopolitical one. And uh, clearly, we've got frameworks in place, such as our closest strategic framework signed by Julie Gillard in 2013. Um, so these are mechanisms that are there for our at ministerial level for meaningful dialogue to take place. And we've got that window of opportunity of course, while we can't take students at the moment, um, over the next half year or so, for those key ministers, such as Simon Birmingham, uh, Dan T and Maurice Payne, who are very willing to engage in dialogue with China to um, uh, do so. Uh, my final point there is that Australia is not the only country that's been um, identified by a country like China uh, as having uh, concerns. South Korea had a similar uh, travel advisory placed on it two years ago. Many of us will remember New Zealand had a similar situation over a decade ago. So it's not only Australia, and um, clearly China's got issues with other countries that we compete against with international students, including USA uh, and Canada, with the um, issues around Huawei and the um, issues there. So, but Rong Yu Lee and Nicole are both China experts, so I shouldn't uh, uh, think that I know all the answers. Look, I, I don't think anybody seriously, uh, you know, gives any credence uh, to uh, um, to what the Chinese government is saying. I, I see this very much as political. 
Um, and uh, I'm very, very glad, very grateful uh, for all of our Chinese students for having the, you know, the courage to, to stand up and, um, and uh, share the positive experiences that they've had. Uh, so I, I agree. I think um, it is getting caught in the geopolitical uh, tension. Um, but I do think uh, they are sending a message. And what we need to do as a country is to reflect you know, how we've got here. I think you know, that's very important. There's no point to escalate the, uh, the tension at all levels. Uh, I don't think the uh, message is for Australian universities or students already here onshore uh, to respond. You know, it's good that people come out to say that Australia is, generally speaking, a safe country for students, for tourists and for, for business people. Uh, but I think, you know, the Chinese government definitely is expecting a response from the Australian government. Uh, that, that's why, you know, that, that message was delivered. And, and the timing of it probably was very carefully chosen uh, because it, the travel ban is in place. Nobody can travel anyway. And so it really, it, it, it's a test. I think it, it all depends on how uh, the Australian government responds. Uh, they do have a lot of uh, tools in, in their toolbox that they could use. Uh, certainly, the one that I can think of is, you know, they don't have to even make another announcement, but if they tighten their foreign currency outflow flow, you know, mechanisms, you know, that's going to do a lot of damage to us. Uh, I do think, you know, as a country, we need to think carefully. Um, we don't have a systemic racial, you know, issue, but we have experienced some incidents of it. So. You know, to say it's non-existent is probably also not a very smart answer. But just recognizing, you know, uh, we've got some isolated incidents and they are being managed very well. And we do take that very seriously as a country, as a sector. I think that that would be the, uh, the right approach. And I do encourage, you know, politicians and governments and ourselves uh, as equal partners to actually sit down and have much more diplomatic uh, constructive, you know, dialogues, rather than actually just use the media to have a tit for tat kind of argument. That's not going to take us anywhere. Mm. Thank you, thank you all. Um, a, a, a sort of a similar question or continuation of that same question um, uh, on over reliance on the single market, and this is not uh, just international education. The government is very much focused on diversification of our trading relationship. Uh, so the question, I guess, what role uh, could and should government play in supporting universities to diversify their source markets? So I might start with you, Nicole. Is there a government role in it? Um, I don't think that that's necessarily been, you know, my experience. Um, you know, individual institutions are, are able to uh, you know, design strategies uh, to their own purpose. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly in, in my career, I've worked, you know, in a range of, of different uh, education environments where, you know, we were, we, we had the, you know, the strategic um, ability to make those decisions. Um, you know, different, different parts of the world represent different value propositions for an institution. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a, you know, it, it's about quality, uh, sometimes it's about strategic alignment with particular areas of research at an institution. Sometimes it's about the, uh, the community that is around uh, the institution uh, and, and, and therefore where their interests most lie. Uh, so I think for each of us, you know, we do have a high level of discretion over, you know, where we choose to go and which students we design our strategies to attract. Um, however, there is always a role for state and for the Commonwealth uh, to, to lead uh, or to shape uh, that strategy. Uh, and they do that through mechanisms such as the level of support that they provide uh, to the sector in different, different parts of the world, uh, through the physical presence that they themselves have, through ministerial delegations, through um, Austrade, through uh, education offices, et cetera, in different parts of the world, but also in particular through uh, assistance programs such as the New Colombo Plan, uh, which is, you know, probably the, the, the signature 
uh, intersection between foreign policy and the international education sector in recent times, very much drawing the outbound experience for Australian university students to focus on Asia uh, and to, uh, to sort of you know, bring us away from our traditional focus and interest on Europe and North America for our outbound uh, student experiences. So that's a good example of, of, of that alignment. So I think there's a role for both of us to play, but I, I think that it is fair to say that institutions have a high degree of autonomy and discretion uh, in, uh, in, in how they construct their international uh, cohort. Uh, I would, sorry, yeah. I would just ju jump in there, Philip, and say the biggest barrier we've got to entry with new markets is our Home Affairs Department. And I, I can say that as a peak body, um, you know, we've got a situation where Austrade, on the one hand, do a great job in promoting Australia as a welcoming, safe, uh, world-ranked uh, education study destination. But for example, Austrade, a couple of years ago, encouraged providers from Australia to go to Africa on uh, recruitment fairs through a number of uh, very well-picked African countries. And I've talked to a number of providers who got persuaded to go with Austrade on this education fair promotion to try and diversify their markets and um, interviewed individual African students, many of whom were outstanding, young, um, you know, highly, highly talented uh, academic uh, prospects. And then Home Affairs Department back in Canberra gave a zero visa approval rate. So back to Rong Yu Lee's point about you know, the vagaries of the federal system of government, yes, our universities have got the autonomy to go forth and multiply and do wonderful things. Yes, we've got a great uh, marketing team in Austrade who promote Australia um, for all the right reasons, but unfortunately, um, uh, compared to countries who compare against like New Zealand, where their immigration department seems to work hand in glove with their trade department, we have this um, silo effect, unfortunately, that our Home Affairs Department has a reputation for preferring to say, you know, computer says no, rather than computer says yes. Um, but I'm sure Rong Yuli has got his own version of that. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, Philip. I, I, first of all, I wouldn't actually uh, draw that conclusion too easily that we are too dependent on China. Uh, it is the largest country by population and it's the second largest economy with a Confucius driven culture, you know, Education is the only way out, you know, family rich or poor, they, they want to provide, you know, good education for their children. So that fuels the demand part of it. And if you do actually want to make comparisons, you know, our cotton export, you know, 80% you know, to China, um, iron ore, you know, 60-70%, and, you know, beef, Australian wine. Uh, I, I don't want to easily draw that conclusion, but it is always a good advice to diversify, to make sure that you develop other markets. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to readily identify a market that can actually replace China. So I'd say uh, it is smart to have diversification strategies uh, to make sure that it is actually aimed at creating a much more cohesive student body, you know, with many cultures, many perspectives, many contributions, but it's not going to be, I don't think the strategy is going to be a good one if it's based on shrinking China and, and growing other you know, markets. I think if you, you take China uh, you to make sure that you've got a, a, a base volume there and you've got you know, business continuity, that's how you actually use the, uh, uh, the, the, the income to you know, work on your diversity uh, initiatives. What Australian government can do a lot if they can actually fund the university system better, you know, especially the research and, and the innovation. So Australia continues to be a competitor in the global marketplace. That, that'll actually be a big step forward. And the other thing is what uh, Phil said, enabling policy framework is very important. Thank you all. Now, I know that we are uh, five minutes uh, over our limit, but um, I want to borrow one of our questioner uh, sort of approach and ask you all just for one minute to tell us what do you think one thing in international education that will remain as a result of the pandemic and what will change? 
Um, and that's based on a question by Mona Kay, who's asking about the five big changes. So Phil, what do you think will, will stay the same and what will change? I think, um, ironically, Philip, we've kind of got international education now better on the, or much more on the radar and perhaps better understood by the wider Australian community, which has been such a challenge. I mean, only yesterday I was doing commercial radio interviews on 2GB, um, uh, on 6PR Perth and so on. Now, they're never interested in talking to us normally, but if anything, COVID-19 and China have actually created or generated an interest in international education. And I think it's, it's created a wake-up call for a lot of businesses in Australia, business leaders and um, wider community to say, gee, this uh, international education uh, sector is really important for Australia's future. So if that's a good thing to come out of COVID-19, uh, I think uh, uh, it's high time it happened. Mm. Nicole. Um, I can't go past the, uh, this great leap forward in, uh, in online delivery. Um, I think that uh, uh, it, it, in many ways it meets the needs of uh, the generations that are currently at university, perhaps rather than the people who are trying to teach them. Uh, and I think it's actually brought the generations much closer together uh, in the, uh, the exchange of, of knowledge. Um, but even more importantly, I think it's actually lifted the quality dramatically um, and at scale um, of what we do in the online space. We now have exemplars um, of online delivery that are so rich, uh, so dynamic, so engaging, uh, that uh, we now will all benefit going forward from a much higher standard um, in, the, in the online experience. And I think that that's, that's one of the, the great gains um, from the COVID-19 experience. Andrew and you? Uh, I, I don't think the pursuit of a higher quality education is going to change um, because I, in fact I, I think demand is going to grow uh, especially uh, when the global economy and the labor market has shifted so much. In, in the changing world of work will mean people will have to constantly reskill and upskill and that requires you know, uh, supply uh, globally. I think so long as Australia maintained its quality education, you know, system at all levels, uh, we will continue to be a popular destination, a country for, for international students. What's going to change is probably the, uh, uh, the geopolitics. And if the uh, US foreign policy remains to be hostile, uh, that's going to change the movement of students between countries. I think you know you you will probably find some regional blocks in terms of you know both the economy you know movements of goods capital and services but also the movement of uh, students uh, that, that that's probably going to to change significantly certainly uh, with the way uh, covid-19 is managed in in the US and the way they cancel you know high degrees by research student visas that's going to drive a different you know behavior of, of, of international students and we could be actually benefiting from it if we manage it well otherwise it could go to the other way mm. thank you uh, very very important messages there uh, well unfortunately we uh, ran out of time uh, but there's so many questions in the chat box uh, so we have to do another event at, at least one more if not if not more than that but First of all, thank you to Phil and to Nicole and Jeanneu for this very insightful discussion. It has been a particularly valuable update for our community, which is predominantly operates in business and policy domains, but international education is such a big part of our engagement with Asia. Um, thank you to all our viewers and listeners for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the event and I'm very sorry we couldn't uh, answer all of your questions. Um, we will definitely do something again on international education, please be assured. Um, our next public program will be on the 25th of June and will be a part of our Disruptive Asia live series, which will look at innovations and food security in the region. And we hope to see you there. And of course, thank you to all our members for joining us and for powering our work. Uh, and if you're not a member yet, uh, please join. 
because behind this very affordable paywall there's a great uh, volume of content and events. So thank you all and thank you to our speakers and to Jenny for being such a great co-host with me. Thanks very much.